of heaven, hell, purgatory, and the afterlife. And so we're going to explore some of the more positive aspects of the afterlife today. The topic of the sermon today is the beatific vision. Uh, let me give you a definition of that. The word beatific is derived from the Latin past participle beatificum, which means to be made happy. Now, I might have a slightly different uh, definition than Nicole. Hers, hers was good. I'm going to just expand on it a little bit. So, happiness is having both joy and pleasing circumstances. How many of you know that's what I am going for? Amen? I mean, having joy is good in the midst of bad circumstances, but I still want my circumstances to be good, right? So, beatificum, which means made happy. Vision comes from the Latin noun visio, sight. So, beatifica visio is a sight that makes one happy. I'm going to read to you from... Charles Wesley, a hymn that he wrote called Father in Whom We Live. Here's one of the stanzas of that hymn. Spirit of holiness, let all thy saints adore thy sacred energy and bless thine heart-renewing power. No angel tongues can tell thy love's ecstatic height the glorious joy unspeakable, the beatific sight. How many of you like to go on vacation? You know the only problem with vacation? You've got to come back to normal life. Plus you ran out of money typically because vacations are expensive. You know, we, uh, my family and I got to go a couple years ago to, my mom paid for us to go to spend 10 days to go to Disney World and Universal Studios in Florida. So it was awesome. You know, we got to <clears throat> go and see and experience something different, which vacation is about going to see amazing things and experience different things. And we probably could have spent another 10 days there. But I, I kind of had the thought while we, were, while we were there, I was like, I wonder if this gets old to the people who work here. You know, I think about things like that. You can see the back entrances where the people who work go in and the, the girls who dress up as Disney princesses. And I wonder if they get tired of these kids clawing at them all day. You know? And then I wondered, I wonder if I spent another 10 days here, if it would be as much fun as it was the first 10 days. Or would it get old? It's called the law of diminishing returns. Are you familiar with this law? So the law is, if you buy an ice cream cone and it's amazing and you think it's so good, if you get another ice cream cone, it'll be just as good, but it never is. It's called the law of diminishing returns. The joy that we experience from things in the created world tend to diminish over time. I got to go on another vacation many years ago. Ah, I got to go to Guatemala. Now, that's the first time I'd been like that far out of the country. I've been across the border, but it's the first time I'd been out of the country. And it was for a location wedding. And so, again, I got to go see and experience an amazing country. Guatemala is beautiful. And we stayed at a really nice place, but I also have some friends that are missionaries in Guatemala. And so the, the guy that I know loves to go on adventures. So he took me to the jungles of Guatemala, where we climbed a live volcano. Now listen, I'm all up for adventure and stuff, but if you were in the United States, this area would probably be partitioned off and no one would be able to go there because somebody's afraid of getting sued. And I'm not kidding. They were, we were up in this volcano and there's like running lava you feel like you're in Lord of the Rings and like Frodo climbing Mordor. And there are people walking out on this lava. And if it were just me, I wouldn't do it. But I'm not going to be a chicken. So I'm, I'm going out there and the hair on my legs are getting singed. 
from this lava. And I'm like, this is not safe. But you know what? I will never forget that adventure. That's another thing about adventures and vacations. The thing that makes it so much fun is that it's a little bit scary. Right? That's why people ride roller coasters. That's why they jump out of airplanes. They love that feeling of, maybe I'll die. It's kind of weird. <laughs> and so when we think about the scripture that Gay read for us, there is an uncreated, super intelligent, all powerful God that no one has seen or even can see. And that's for now. But it tells us something else in the book of 1 Corinthians. This is the love chapter from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9. Here's what it discusses in regards to God's plan for our future. And so we have this being that really is terrifying on the, one, on the one hand, but is fascinating and incomprehensibly beautiful on the other hand. And here's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, whenever I became mature, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then we'll see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. The scripture is talking about, it's the, the chapter is about love. <clears throat> and so ultimately, when we talk about holiness, without holiness, no one will see God. When we talk about being mature in holiness, what we're really talking about is being mature in love. And the Bible says there's going to come a day in which that veil that separates us from being able to see God clearly is going to be lifted and we will see God for who he is. We will know him as he knows us. And the beautiful thing about that sight, the beatific vision, is that seeing that will produce unspeakable pleasure in our spirits. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, whenever a person turns to the Lord, whenever they're born again, there is a veil removed. And so we're able to see God in part whenever we're born again. In verse 17, it says, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. Now, I want to be clear that we understand what's being said here. When we call ourselves Christians, what that word means is Christ-like. Okay? And so, the Bible is teaching us that beholding the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed into that same image, from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so church, let me tell you, again, in the spirit of John Wesley, how we interpret the Scripture. When all possible, the plain, literal meaning of the text is to be preferred. And so you have a pastor who believes the Bible. I believe all of it. And what this is telling us is what we're beholding, which is God, we're being transformed into that same image. That's radical. 
The Bible says we have the ability in part now to look upon God and to experience the joy and the beauty and the ecstasy of what we're beholding. Now, how many of you in here have had a religious experience before? You don't have to raise your hand. I just want you to think about it. Have you had a personal encounter with God before that radically changed your life? We see that a lot at church camp. When we take kids to church camp, we see them encounter God in ways that are life-changing. I've personally had encounters with God uh, that radically changed my life instantly. And I got a taste of what that vision is like. And a lot of us spend the rest of our church lives trying to reclaim or chase that experience. And we're wondering why we can't experience that all the time. Well, church, God is doing that on purpose because he wants to produce a yearning in you for something more than what you have. I, uh, I had a friend who was a police officer in Amarillo, and he, he goes through police training, and he tells me the story about you know, they have so many problems with people who abuse, like, really hard drugs. He was talking about one in particular, crystal meth. Why is that pastor preaching about crystal meth? We don't want to hear about that Sunday morning. It's an important illustration. It says, people who use crystal meth for the first time will dump, like, 90% of their body's dopamine. They will never be physically capable of doing that again, and they'll spend the rest of their lives chasing that same experience that they can never get. You know, a lot of times religious people are like that. But what God is doing, He wants to give us a taste of what He's like. And then he wants to produce a yearning within us to get to experience the beauty of the beatific vision. And that yearning is to produce in us a chasing after the things of God, after the character, again, the mind, the speech, and the behavior that will provide us with a conduit to getting to see and experience God like that again. Church, God is at work in this life to produce within us the mind, the speech, and the behavior that will be a conduit to get to experience that beauty in a, an intense way. And the Bible says that in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, that glory never fades. You spend all that money to go on a vacation, get to experience these amazing things, but it always gets old. And the beauty of the beatific vision is that whenever we get to see God, not only does it never get old, it gets better with time. There's a fascinating verse in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah actually gets to see God, the Bible says. And it kind of contradicts what we read in uh, the verse from Timothy. But likely this is a vision. And so in your body, you're not capable of seeing God. But out of body, when you've dropped your fallenness, your impurities, your sin... Isaiah gets to be in the presence of God. And it's a fascinating verse in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. It says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood the seraphim. Now that would be a name for a heavenly being. Uh, the generic word that we use is angels, but... That's not technically correct in this instance. It's a throne guardian. A being who guards and protects the holiness of God from impurities. 
Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. Now think about this. This is a heavenly being, not encumbered by sin and fallenness like you and I are, who gets to be around the throne of God. And so these are creatures in comparison with human beings, are like gods. It says, each had, each had six wings. With the wings, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. In other words, in the presence of God, the energy is so intense. And I might even say the joy is so intense that they have to protect themselves from it. Verse 3, and one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost and I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. So in the presence of this holiness, Isaiah is feeling the intensity of his inadequacy before this being. And church, that is appropriate. Many times when uh, people come to church, especially lost people who aren't typically accustomed with church and they, weren't, they, they, they didn't grow up in church, a lot of times these people will come to church and they'll say, I hate going to church. It just makes me feel so guilty. All they do is judge me. In church, hardly anybody is judging that person. The presence of God makes a person feel their inadequacy. And there isn't any person doing it. It's the presence of God. It produces a, it produces a thing called conviction. And conviction is a good thing. It's just like that yearning, that desire to experience God again. That conviction is intended to drive you to a place of repentance. So you can be reconciled with God and begin to make progress in holiness because God wants you to experience His presence and His power. Listen, the human spirit was designed with a longing for the presence of God. And you don't know it until you experience it. But there is nothing that can produce more pleasure, more joy than the manifest presence of God. But when that presence is there, a lot of times it will make you feel bad. Look at what it says in the next verse, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth. In other words, he purified Isaiah. Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Now, what's really fascinating about this to me, because this same scene is described in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 8. And in that verse, it says, the four living creatures, each of them having six wings, again, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy. Now, here's my translation for that. I'm going to give you the Kendall Meek translation. Oh my God. Wow. It says that's all these beings do and they never cease to be amazed at what they're looking at. And the, the unique thing for us, you know, these beings, the Bible doesn't say that, the Bible says that we have a special and unique relationship with God as human beings. 
And so the, the difference is that whenever we get to look upon this being one of these days, we're going to be transformed into that image. And since God is infinite in being, we're going to be changing and evolving and transforming for all eternity. Wow. When we talk about the afterlife and God's plans for the future, <laughs> we're talking about something that has a radical implications for God, what God wants to do and produce in us. We are in training now to get to stand in the presence of God. And what we present to Him one of these days at the judgment seat is going to determine the access that we have to that divine presence. And church, let me be clear. When I say that heaven is going to be good for everyone, it's not going to be the same for everyone. Another way that I could say that is, everyone is going to have access to this beautific vision, this beautific sight. Not everyone is going to have equal access to this beautific vision and this beautific sight. I want to read to you a little bit about what the Scripture says about the next age. Because the next age entails some things that we've already established. There will be a bodily resurrection from the dead. You're going to be raised from the dead to live on this same earth. And there will be a world inhabited by people for all eternity. Now church, that is the plan. That is a non-negotiable truth taught in Scripture. It's taught from Genesis to Revelation. So I want to speak to you about what, we might, what the world might look like whenever God comes down to live on this earth and fully manifest His presence. What are going to be some of the dynamics that we, we need to kind of think about and prepare for? Now I'm going to quote to you some early church fathers. I'm going to try and get on my uh, bike and pedal really fast here. Because this is somewhat lengthy. But it's important that I say this because I get asked all the time, well, how do we know that's what that means? Right? I'm going to be quoting to you from two of the earliest church fathers. One, a man by the name of Polycarp, who was personally discipled by the Apostle John. He probably got it right. Are you with me? Another one who was discipled and even ordained by this same man, Polycarp, Irenaeus. So first of all, we're going to read to you from, uh, excuse me, Papias, not Polycarp. But both of them were discipled by John. <clears throat> Papias, he lived from 70 to 155 A.D. He asserts that he heard in person Aristion, who was a disciple of Jesus, a d direct disciple of Jesus, and the presbyter John. He talks about a millennium after the resurrection from the dead when the personal reign of Christ will be established on this earth. Now I'm going to read to you from Irenaeus. He talks about how we should interpret uh, prophecy. And he says... If any should endeavor to allegorize prophecies, that is, to make it mean something that it, other than what it says. You guys know what an allegory is? Like you take a story, and the story is not to be taken real, it's just describing something else. He's saying, if anybody does this, they shall not be found consistent with themselves in all points, and shall be confuted by the teaching of the very expressions in question. In other words, they're going to wind up looking stupid. If you don't take Bible prophecy to say what it means, it means what it says. That's going to make you look stupid in the end. <clears throat> Here's what he says. When the cities of the Gentiles shall be desolate so that they be not inhabited 
and the houses so that there shall be no men in them and the land shall be left death desolate for behold says Isaiah the day of the Lord cometh past remedy full of fury and wrath to lay waste the city of the earth and to root the sinners out of it and again he says let him be taken away that he behold not the glory of God. And when these things are done, he says, God will remove men far away, and those that are left shall multiply on the earth. In other words, life is going to continue on the earth uh, after the return of Jesus Christ. And they shall build houses and shall inhabit them themselves, and plant vineyards, and eat of them themselves. For all these and other words were unquestionably spoken in reference to the resurrection of the just, which takes place after the coming of Antichrist and the destruction of all nations under his rule, in the times of which the resurrection of the righteous shall reign in the earth, waxing stronger by the sight of God Himself. And through Him, they shall become accustomed to partake in the glory of God the Father and shall enjoy in the kingdom intercourse and communion with holy angels and union with spiritual beings. Isn't that fascinating? Irenaeus continues on. <clears throat> when these things therefore pass away above the earth, John the Lord's disciple says that the new Jerusalem above shall then descend as a bride adorned for her husband, and that this is the tabernacle of God in which God will dwell with men. Of this Jerusalem, the for former one is an image, that Jerusalem of the former earth which the righteous are discipled beforehand for incorruption and prepared for salvation. And of this tabernacle, Moses received the pattern in the mount, and nothing is capable of being allegorized, but all things are steadfast and true and substantial, having been made by God for righteous men's enjoyment. For as it is God who truly raises up man, so also does man truly rise from the dead, and not allegorically, as I have shown repeatedly. As he rises actually, so also shall he be actually disciplined beforehand for incorruption or holiness, and shall go forwards and flourish in the times of the kingdoms in order that he may be capable of receiving the glory of the Father. Church, that is sound doctrine. I want to read to you one more thing from the book of Isaiah, or excuse me, the book of Zechariah, and then I'll wind this up. So we'll wind it up with this. Now here's the point. We're painting a picture a mature picture of what to expect in the afterlife that tells us what we're to be doing with our time, our energy, and our resources here and now. We are to be chasing holiness. That is the conduit by which we're going to get to experience God in the next age. And it's not going to be the same for everyone. I'm going to read to you from Zechariah 14, chapter 8. Now in this chapter... It describes a few things. The book of Zechariah describes the war of Armageddon, the war that tries to keep Jesus from reclaiming the nations of the earth. It describes the return of Jesus Christ, and it describes his assumption as ruler of the nations. So when Jesus returns to the earth, he's going to assume leadership or headship of the governments of the earth, and he, these verses are describing what life is going to be like underneath his leadership. Now pay attention to this. You realize I'm not making any of this up, right? I'm just reporting the facts. 
Zechariah 14, 8. On that day, speaking of on the heels of the return of Jesus Christ, on that day, living waters shall flow out of Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea, half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Skipping down to verse 16. Then everyone who survives. I'm going to pause right there and let you think about the implications of that. Everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem in the battle of Armageddon shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths. In other words, worship will be mandatory. You don't get the option to go watch the Cowboys on Sunday. And what's interesting as well, the Feast of Booths was the commanded festival of the Jew, Jews where they paid their tithe every year. Isn't that interesting? Verse 17. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain. There shall be the plague with which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the feast of booths. This shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to keep the feast of booths. Have you ever read that before? So whenever I say heaven's going to be good for everyone, it's not going to be equally good for everyone. I'm just telling you what the scripture teaches. And so what are the implications of that? Your personal holiness, developing an appetite for the things of God, becoming someone whose, whose thoughts and whose speech and whose behavior are in harmony or in sync with God's holiness will better prepare you to experience things that are unimaginable in the next life or not. I'm going to read to you from Revelation 12. I'm going to end with, end with this one. So bear with me. What we read from Zechariah is consistent with what we read from the book of Revelation. It says the same thing. Revelation 22, verse 22. In case you're one of those people that says, I don't believe in the Old Testament, I just believe in the New Testament. It's all consistent. Here's what it says. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light... The nations walk. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Or their tithe. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those whose names are written in the book of life. Now what's fascinating about that is we've got the beatific vision, which is going to be the centerpiece of eternity, getting to behold and gaze upon God. I can't even think of a way to describe what that's going to be like, but I can describe the other part of the vision. There is going to be life in the nations that continues on as usual. 
And when it says that the kings of the earth bring their glory into it, it's talking about the unique things that the nations are going to produce that bring value and pleasure and life to normal everyday people. And they're going to bring it in and put it on display in front of God. And he's going to say, that's really cool. I'm pleased with that. Now think about that. Could you imagine living in, let's say, Isaiah's time? We'll, we'll call it the Iron Age, when man is just discovering iron and making really strong tools with it. Could you imagine being teleported from that time frame into our time frame here and now? They would be looking at things that they could not have any earthly explanation for. I mean, it would, it would just be a, a world of wonders, right? Now take that and multiply it by a million. If we were to transport ourselves into this world that God intends to build, we wouldn't be able to wrap our minds around it. There are going to be people, okay, that list, think about this, that get to behold God, that are transformed into His image, and then what did God do? He created the physical universe. And so when people are looking at God and being transformed, they are going to be transformed into this creative being that gets to produce wonders for the nations to enjoy. Wow. Now listen, I'm not just intending to like scare you into holiness, okay? My intent is to be in training in godliness because God wants to produce in you a creativity that will bring value to the world that you never could have thought you were capable of. You are capable of wonders. That's real. And that training starts here and now. Amen. Sorry, I went four minutes over. I apologize. We're going to have altar time now. Uh, now's the time where you're welcome to come forward and light a candle and, and prayers for a loved one or, or some other issue that you're concerned about. You're welcome to spend time at the altar. If you've never joined our church, now's a good time to become a member of First Methodist Tobbs. We would love to include you in our family here. If you've never been baptized, baptism is something a believer is commanded to do. We invite you to come and uh, seek baptism in our church. The altars are open at this time. I'd love to talk with you, uh, but you're welcome to come and light a candle or kneel at the altar.
All right, stand as you're able if you can. Join us in our closing hymn, Pass It On. Yeah. 
trees are falling, the birds begin to sing, the flowers start their blooming. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you want to see. Let me pray over you before you're dismissed. Father, I thank you for the people gathered in this building, the body of Christ. Thank you for your power that is present to produce holiness in your people. And Father, thank you that that holiness is intended to produce within them gifts, abilities, talents, graces that will bring tremendous value to wherever you send them in the world this week. So Father, we thank you for the pleasure and the enthusiasm you have for your people. You want to see them thrive and flourish and do all kinds of amazing things. We are in training for our eternal assignment. We have that in part here and now. And so Father, thank you for your grace that is on your people to go and be amazing people and do amazing things. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.